the first thing to say is that irritative symptoms, uh, and I don't like the term irritative symptoms, so let's have dysuria and storage symptoms. Dysuria <clears throat> in the two reasonable randomized studies that have been done, the one from uh, Carlos Salente and Miguel Capitan in Madrid using the 120 and the Goliath study have shown that dysuria is actually a little bit less with green light than with TURP. That's when patients are asked after three days, do you have any pain when you pass urine? Do you need to take painkillers for it? But I think with the 80 watt machine, back in the day of laser scope, when people weren't being trained and were doing a very minimal operation, yeah, there were some people who were coagulating tissue and getting uh, more dysuria than they should have been. But that's technique. You know, if you do a very, very bad coagulative TURP and don't remove tissue, you'll get more dysuria then. In terms of storage symptoms, um, yeah, there was a very marginal difference in increased storage symptoms between one, between the the arms and the Goliath study at the six week to eight week point, uh, but that disappeared by the three month point. So I, I personally think, that, think it's probably um, the fact that we had slightly higher storage symptoms in the uh, Goliath group than the TORP group to begin with because the subplot analysis doesn't show a big difference. I think you have to say to any patient who's having any bladder outflow surgery, you may find your symptoms get worse before they get better. And I think again with the early days of green light back in the 19. Uh, back in 2003, 2004, we had a lot of patients who were told, this is easy, you have no side effects at all, it's, a child could do it, it's not, it's an operation, it must be done properly, and the patients need to realise that it is equivalent to having a TURP, um, and th but they'll probably have less symptoms. If you tell them there'll be no complications, they'll complain because they'll be unhappy. Uh, in terms of reoperation, we're not seeing a significant difference in the two arms of the Goliath group. Um, I can, we've, we've, uh, presented, we haven't published our long term reoperation rate out to seven years with the 80 watt uh, machine, and we found it was about 1.1% reoperation per annum, prostates less than 100 grams. Now, I have to say that was using much less energy than we're using now. Um, but we have the Igloo five year data using the very earliest uh, XPS data, which Andrea just showed you there. And that's again going to be showing about a reoperation of 1% per annum for BPH. So Probably a bit less than the average TRP series, certainly a little bit higher than uh, the average HOLAP series, but they're not, they're not the same operation. You know, this is a very safe operation with reasonable reoperation rates. Mr. Busher Hayes. Gordon, uh, given the uh, difficulties that there are in travel around cities like London, as you've experienced mm -hmm. today, do you have a geographical and or time cutoff in terms of how far or what, how long it is for a patient to get back yeah. to you? as being a day case or not? Sure. We, we ask the patients to be within one hour of the hospital, but, you know, in London, that could be two miles. Um, so, you know, you have to have some, some limits. It, it would be unreasonable to take a... And, it, and, again, it depends on, you know, if the patient's son is a GP and he lives two hours away and you're doing it in the morning, that's, that's fine. You have to be sensible about it. And each, each daycare unit must have its rules. It depends, I think, on your patient population, on the level of social support, on how well you know the GPs do have a hospital at home service for the very elderly, for example. I don't think it's right to do a 91-year-old who's got an 85-year-old wife with macular degeneration and then not have somebody visit them in the morning. If you do have somebody visit them in the morning, they're fine. But if not, that's not right. So I think it depends on your service. Uh, we haven't found anybody who's not safe for daycare if they're looking after themselves to begin with. I think that's, would you agree with that, Ian? Um, and, and, and I joke not about the patient. You know, one of the patients who stayed with me was a guy I did a TURP on a month before I started at King's. He came in, three days later we did his TURP. He was voiding on day five. He stayed in for three and a half weeks because they found out he was blind. And I was saying, well, I didn't poke his eyes out. Um, but they did a social work assessment and finally he fell out of bed in the middle of the night, got a subdural hematoma and was dead. Um, you know, and, and they can, we don't even have our retentions coming into the hospital at all. Discharge from casualty is seen in the Tewat clinic if they fail, trust and into day, day unit. It's a massive saving on resource and we think it's safer for the elderly patients. I think green light is widely adopted now in the UK. I think there are several reasons why the uptake's been slow. I think first of all, and this has nothing to do with AMS Boston, the first company who marketed it were not, I think, interested in outcomes. I think that's fair to say, David, you were around at the time. Um, and they didn't do any proper training. So a lot of people were given the machine without training and they made a bad result. You know, what do you expect? Um, secondly, I think in the UK, we have a lot of people who metaphorically had their fingers burned with lasers back in the 90s. You know, I, I was fiddling about lasers when I was a registrar with the Eurolase. And all I remember is patients you know, walking around like that. 
three weeks until we did a TURP to get their penile pin away. So that, that gave us a bad, you know, and, and the urolase and microwave, et cetera, if you get through the first three months, you get reasonable outcomes from it. You know, there are plenty of papers showing okay data with uh, these treatments. But if you coagulate the prostate, it hurts for a long time for a lot of patients. Um, and then I think NICE has been a real problem. NICE, I don't think, and I'm a NICE advisor, I don't think NICE understands uh, data. You know, we weren't allowed to put in 80% of the patients we treat at King's um, who are very high-risk patients into the Goliath study, but they want randomized data. And NICE thinks that a, a randomized trial of 20 versus 20 is better than a prospective registry of 5,000, and it's clearly not. Um, so I think we've got a problem with, with NICE, and you know, I've had this out with them, and we've got data coming soon, um, which will show that probably the majority of single-center randomized trials are either very badly conceived or fraudulent. Uh, in urology. We'll have to do that for a number of those specialties. Uh, you know, the data's out there, um, and it's, you know, there isn't one best operation for Lutz BPH. I think, as Shimim and I are both working at Guys and Kings, we, we, between us, have everything there is to offer, and I think that's what you should do. Uh, but if you're looking for a standard procedure, would I let a relative of mine have a TURP? Not if there was green light available. Would, would I definitely recommend uh, green light if he had a 190-gram prostate? Depends if he's fit or not. Would I recommend green light to my, my brother who's 46 who wants to keep ejaculating? I might not. You know, there are lots of options available, but I think for the average patient we see, it's the safest and it's very easy to teach as well. Will NICE change its approach? Well, I think it has to. I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. You know, the, what's bizarre is the Goliath study, whatever you think of green light, is definitely the best randomized study ever done, done in Lutz BPH. Um, and NICE hasn't included it in the most recent assessment. It just beggars belief. Um, so I think it has to, and uh, we'll see what happens there. There's a question there, yeah. In the Goliath study, um, the large glands were disqualified. Yeah. Not sure why that happened, and I think you would have found much more of a separation between um, a TURP versus a laser. Are there any studies coming up that will take those into account? Because that's where you really can make a huge difference, I think. The exclusion criteria uh, in Goliath were largely put upon by the external safety committee, uh, including somebody who might have been quite heavily involved in, uh, is he here, in the NICE guidelines at the time. Um, so, you know, and, I, and I, I thought that was a problem. You know, clearly, how do you randomize doing TURPs versus green light in patients on warfarin? It would be unethical to do that because we publish in the 62% of anticoagulated patients. Um, but then not to be able to say, well, we'll take that evidence without randomization. We went to NICE and said, so, you know, can we treat these patients? They said, no, we want a randomized trial. Well, what, you know, versus an alpha blocker? We can't do it against TURP. Um, so it's very difficult. And we, we're slightly, NICE is very good in many ways, but we're very constrained in the UK by having this very rigid approach. And I think a sensible approach is appropriate. Um, and I think, yeah, if we'd done over 100 grams, um, I think it's a different question. Then, you know, we're looking at hold up versus nuclear. I don't think you should be doing a TURP in a 120-gram prostate. We know the risk of bleeding is much greater. There's no reason to do it. Hold up is a better operation. Sorry I said that. Um, but if you've got a patient who's 85, who's on Plavix, he doesn't need 90 grams of that prostate removed. He needs 50 or 60 grams removed, and he will void happily until he dies. And we want, what you don't want to do is die in the first week after surgery. I'll just make a comment in relation to that, having done a randomized trial of green yes. light. Um, and the limitation for the gland size was actually because of TURP. Yeah, absolutely. And we yeah. cut it off at 80, yeah, uh, 80 cc's yeah. because that was what we felt in Australia was safe yeah. to, for your TURP. So mm. in actual fact, there wasn't, it wasn't the green light side. It was the TURP side, and that was what yes. was mandated. We based our trial design on Peter Gilling's trial design, and Goliath has been very similar. Yeah. But in terms of NICE, they haven't accepted that paper because it was outside of the UK, yes. which is you know, very unfortunate, I think, it's given bizarre. that one of the authors was, is Ben Chalicum, yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I, don't, I, I agree. I, I don't know NICE at all, but I don't understand their thinking on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's true. And I think the, the member also, for, particularly for the trainees in the audience, uh, Traditionally, people in the UK will have a go at bigger prostates with TURP than the vast majority of other countries. There are very few other, well, there are very few non-North European countries 
where anybody would feel comfortable doing a TURP in a gland they knew to be much bigger than about 75 grams. And I think you'd find in the USA, uh, if somebody experienced bleeding or absorption with a prostate of 90 grams in TURP, they would fight to get out of uh, a legal suit there. So the, the, the majority of the world, 80 grams is the top for TURP, and then they'll go for open prostatectomy, which has always seemed odd to me, but that's why we had the limitation. I would like to um, thank all our speakers today uh, for the contribution uh, they've made uh, on behalf of Boston Scientific. I would like to thank you, the audience, for uh, asking lots of very good questions. And finally, I'd like to thank you for uh, allowing me to come in and uh, speak to you without uh, any heckling. Thank you very much indeed.